Good morning, good morning. Welcome to church. It's a little hour early, right? Hour early. Or it's an hour late, depending on how you want to look at it, I guess. Uh, for us, it's like uh, with the feeding and I, I don't even know what day. I, I really don't know what day it is, right? So uh, it's, it's all coming together, right? It's all coming together. So I want to talk a little bit about... Uh, you know, the tithe and the offering. I first want to let you know that we do have an app, you know, that you can download. If you go to your uh, app store or Google Play store, it's, uh, you know, Restored Church. Uh, you can download that app. You can text to give if you want to give. We have the ushers that may come to collect it old school way, right? Cash and check, right? I, I don't know if people still do that anymore, but uh, we'll, we'll have it. <laughs> now, Joe, that was back there. Freaked me out a little bit. So uh, I want to talk a little about the tithe message today, you know. I want, I want to talk about Malachi, you know, chapter 3, verse 10, but I want to hold there for a second. I want to read this article from people.com, and no, this is not about Tiger Woods, okay? Okay, I'm going to make sure I say that because it says, a California man who had been seriously injured in an automobile accident had been, on a had been on disability checks for years after his injuries permanently ended a career in carpentry. After running out of the disability checks, the financial struggle went from bad to worse for his family. To the extent of his children sent to live with their grandparents across the country in Louisiana. Because he could not afford to support them, things were on a downward spiral until one day he recognized a Navajo blanket on an Antiques Roadshow television program that was suspiciously similar to an old blanket he had inherited from his great-grandmother who had since passed. After finding this blanket tucked away in an old dusty box, he had it appraised for a selling price and ultimately sold it in an auction for $1.5 million a great blanket. I'm like, I'm just start searching through the stuff I got in my house right now. So, uh, <laughs> we have like Afghans, right? I don't think it's worth anything. But anyway, so, uh, uh, now he had this, this, here's the thing, he had this blanket the entire time. He went through this struggle, he went through everything that was happening to him. Uh, through all the struggle, through all the fight to make ends meet, he was sitting on a gold mine, but he had not, he did not recognize it. He did not tap into his blessing. Financial blessing from God is the same way. He has provided the route for us to take to be blessed in our finances. Let's take a look at the scripture now. Malachi 3.10. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. That's right. All. All means all. Okay? A-L-L, -L, all. So, uh, just gets out an accent. So, uh, and try me. So he says, and try me now in this. The, the Lord doesn't say, try me anywhere else in the Bible except for right here, right now. It's the only place he says to try him, right? If you remember correctly, uh, when Jesus was getting tempted, uh, the, the, uh, the devil said, well, well, just jump off the thing and, and you know, step out in faith. You know, jump off this bridge and show that your father. And he says, he, he Jesus literally tells the devil that that's not the way the word works, right? And so right here it does, okay? It says, if... He says, uh, he says, the Lord of hosts says, if I will not open up the windows of heaven and pour out, pour out for you such blessing that there will be room enough to receive it. God has provided the way for us to work within his kingdom. But first we have to give in order to receive. And I think the best illustration of this is when you have something in your hand and you want to give it, your hands now open so you can receive. But if you're holding on to it, you can't. When someone goes, listen, I, we're, we're doing this thing with the, with, with the baby, and Jalen's trying to hand me stuff, and I'm feeding him, and I'm, like, using my chin to hold the bottle so I can reach down and grab something. I can tell you right now, it's like, it's like, uh, it's like gymnastics, right? I'm like, I'm like, let me get that door open here. And so I can tell you this, look, if she's trying to hand me something, and I don't have anything in my hands, I can't really get it, right? I mean, I just, if I have something in my hand, I can't get a hold of it, so... That's exactly what he's saying to do. And I know Pastor has talked about for the last couple of weeks, he's talked about the fact that God has talked more about prospering and being blessed in the Bible than he does anything else. Anything else. To me, that's probably a good, that's like a heart, that's a good sign. We probably should pay attention to getting blessed, right? We should probably walk around in blessing. We should probably be speaking blessing over other people. Not that we're not going to go through trials and struggles because we don't have victory without a struggle. You know that, right? Everyone knows that, right? I mean, come on. We watched the Buccaneers win, right? We watched the Buccaneers win. They said Tom Brady, which I know this is for pastor, okay? Tom Brady's too old. He can't do it anymore. 
Joker just signed another deal for another couple years, okay? Look, look, listen, whether you love, I, I, didn't, I didn't like Tom Brady, okay? I didn't like Tom Brady because I'm a Bronco fan. He played for the Patriots, and that's just how it works, right? But I got to tell you, I was rooting for him in the Super Bowl because we're around the same age. He's actually a little older, but it's okay. We're around the same age, and <clears throat> sorry, say that. <clears throat> get my arm ready, right? Uh, <laughs> that would be fun. So uh, uh, that would be a hilarious reel. It would be like water boy. Um, anyway, so uh, so he, the thing I wanted you to say is, look, when, when God is speaking to you through his word and you start to be obedient to that word, he shows that we sang about it, right? God will be right there with us in the storm. We've got to count it all joy. See, listen. Sometimes things aren't happening to you, they're happening for you, you know? And if we can just grasp that, that nothing's happening to us, it's happening for us, it's something we need to learn, right? Because when you lose, you learn. You don't lose, you learn, right? You win every single game. Look, there's only been one team in the NFL to ever win every single game and go on to win the Super Bowl. Do you realize that was a long, long, long time ago, right? They've never done it since. No one's ever done it since. It was the Dolphins, right? They've never done it since. So if one team out of all the years has only done it once, I would say that, listen, you've got to be able to lose something to learn something. So, listen, with this right here in our tithe, let's start to give and let's start to expect and press in. Because, listen, if you're going to give your tithe, my personal belief, if you give your tithe, you should start asking God for what you want, right? What do, what do I want? What do I need to have here? Start giving that tithe into the church and watch what happens. So let's, let's go ahead and pray. Lord, Father God, I thank you for today, Lord. I thank you for the word. I thank you for the ability to go out and serve you. I thank you for what we're doing, what you're doing in our lives here in this church. I thank you for what you're, what message you're trying to get to us, Lord. I pray that we will step back and realize what it is. Lord, Father God, we will follow you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, guys, good morning. All right, great to be in the house of the Lord today. Anybody excited about the word? Two people, fantastic. Come on, we can do better than that. Anybody excited about the Word of God today? If so, say amen. All right, going to be a good day, not because I'm here. Going to be a good day because He is here. Can you say amen? All right, guys, uh, I, I kind of got a kick out of what Mike was saying about uh, Brady and, and the Bucks, And uh, I'll be the first to say, uh, if I could follow up what he said, I was never a Tom Brady fan. As a matter of fact, I did not like him. Come on, you can say amen if you, if you agree with me. I, I, I did not like the dude until, uh, until he became a buccaneer. Then I became an a, a ultimate Tom Brady fan, come on, and, and won that Super Bowl, and I'm believing for another one next year. Come on, don't shout me down when I'm preaching good, somebody. I'm believing for another one next year, amen. Hey, guys, uh, what I want to do today is we're going to start a brand new series. We only have a couple of more weeks until Easter, amen. And we're going to start a brand new series today. But before we go any further, can we just go ahead and take a time out and, and go to the Lord in prayer and pray uh, that God will have his perfect will and his perfect way today. Can we do that now? Let's, let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for what we feel. Lord, I, I know a lot of churches are decimated by this pandemic. And, and Lord, it has hit us very, very hard. Lord, not only in our attendance, God, but also in our finances. However, I know, God, that you are the God that is still on the throne. God, you still own the cattle on a thousand hills. And, and God, the Bible says all the wealth belongs to you. And, and God, I, I look to you because you are my help. You are our source. And, and Father, I praise you in the process. Father, we praise you even in this pandemic. God, we give you praise and glory because once again, God, we know that you are in control of everything. And Father, I pray right now that you would touch us. Lord, that you would anoint us. God, you would empower us to, Lord, not only to hear your word, God, but receive your word. Lord, let it slip 18 inches from our head to our heart, Father, and then we can allow change to take place and do anything and everything, God, that you've called us and that you've equipped us to do. And Father, I thank you for, for anointing me. Lord, I, I would be nothing more than a clinging symbol without your love and without your anointing. So Father, would you please reach down from that holy and heavenly throne 
And God, touch me, anoint me, empower me today to preach what you've given me to give to this body of believers. And God, I'm careful today to give you all the praise and all the glory because your name is above every name. Your name is worthy to be praised. And we give you praise and thanks for it all. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And amen. Guys, do me a favor. Can you give the Lord a hand clap of praise real quickly? Can we do that today? Amen. Amen. Now, today what I want to do by the help of the Holy Ghost is preach a message entitled, The Road to the Cross. Amen. The Road to the Cross. And as I was saying a couple of minutes ago, we have a, uh, about three weeks or so before we get into the Easter series. But in, in starting this series today, what I want to do is ask you a, a couple of questions. And I just want to be very, uh, very honest today. Can we do that? And so if I say something that you agree with, you can say amen. If I say something that you don't like, you can say oh me. But I, I just challenge you to say something today. Amen. Uh, so let me ask you a question as we start this message off. Have you ever had a battle raging on the inside of you? Maybe a battle in your head or a battle in your heart. And you found yourself desperately trying to control something. We all have. Can you say amen? Come on. If you don't raise your hand, we'll pray for liars right now. Come on, guys. We, we've all, come on, we've, we've all had a, an issue at one time or another trying to control something. Amen? See, I, I venture to say that maybe it's that still small voice that we're trying to keep quiet because we want it our way, not God's way. And, and once again, I think that maybe control will override our convictions that scream at us. When you and I find ourselves on the losing end, it's sad but true that we as Christians often resist the very God that we say that we respect, that we love, and that we trust. And what makes matters worse is we know the word. We read it, we believe it, we apply it, but for some reason we still find ourselves struggling and resisting God by not wanting to surrender to our Savior. You're getting awful quiet on me. I'm just getting started. And I believe that we're still stuck. And because of this, we can't move on. So we, we find ourselves, if you will, in a fierce fight, fighting with our Heavenly Father. And the entire time, God is trying to tell us just to let it go. Let me have it. I believe that God is saying some of the things that we echoed in the last couple of weeks of our series. God is saying, look, I'm the owner. I'm the I'm the master. I'm the owner. You're the steward. Come on, guys. I'm the master. You're just the manager. And by the way, I'm a whole lot better boss than you will ever be. Come on, somebody. That's exactly what God is saying. Listen, guys, I believe it's safe to say that, that every one of us have some certain areas that we like to wrestle with and that we like to think that we actually control them. And I'm going to tell on myself this morning for just a brief couple of minutes. And, and look, I, let me preface this quickly. Every one of us have something that we're trying to control. Would you believe that? Would you say amen if you believe that? I don't care where it's at or, or, or who it might be with, but every one of us have something that we're trying to control. Come on, say amen if you believe that. For me, look, I, I like to control what time I eat. And, and I believe what I'm going to do is I'm going to preach to the men for just a couple of minutes. Can I do that today? Look, man, I, I like to control the time I eat because I'm married to a woman that forgets to eat. There's times when she was uh, in, in Vegas last week. I, I, I remember speaking to her on the phone and, and we talked and, and I said, what would you eat? She goes, I forgot to eat. I said, look, in my brain, come on, guys, as, as a person who eats six and seven times a day, I thought, what do you mean you forgot to eat? My brain, don't com just, my brain does not compute that. Come on. Can I get a witness, somebody? I've never forgotten to eat in my life. As a matter of fact, by 1 o'clock, if I don't have my second or third meal in, I'm about ready to backslide. Come on, somebody. I'm way beyond hungry, and I get hangry. Come on. See, that's an area that, that I wrestle with, and I, I, I find myself trying to control uh, that part of my life, but another part I, I find myself trying to control is my castle. Come on, every man has a castle. 
It's called the house. Can I get a witness? Somebody in, inside that castle, I've got a throne. It's my chair that's closest to the TV. Can I get a witness? Somebody. <laughs> that's off limits. Come on. Can I get a witness? Somebody. That's, that's my chair. Don't sit in Big Daddy's chair. That's, that's my chair. Don't get in that or I'll give you the eye. Come on. And, and listen, in, in, that, in, that, in my castle, in my domain, if you will, there's something else that I like to control. It's called the remote control. Can I get a witness, somebody? Come on, I'm preaching to some guys right now. Because that remote don't belong in anybody's hand except mine. That's my remote, and nobody can work it like I can. As a matter of fact, if you come to my house and you got the remote, I might start twitching a little bit because it don't belong to you. Can you say amen? Listen, I said all that to say this. Every one of us have some areas in our life that we wrestle with that we want to control. But here's the problem with you and I being a control freak. We don't give God access into the areas where we need him the most. Come on, shake your head this way. And when that happens, it cheapens our Christianity. And the people we're trying to reach and the ones in our family and the ones who, we don't, who, who don't go to church are actually watching us. Come on, somebody. See, they see that we can talk the talk, but we can't walk the walk. They see that we say one thing and do another. They see that we can preach it, but we just can't practice it. I hate to say this, but the world has a word for this, and it's called hypocrite. Come on, somebody. Then we begin to beat our heads against the wall. Come on, I'm about to start preaching. Get ready. We beat our heads against the wall, frustrated, and we begin to be fed up, and we wonder why we cannot reach the people we're trying to reach. But then all of a sudden, the realization takes place that we are no different than they are. You're thinking, man, I can't wait for Jennifer to be back up here. <laughs> and see, I, I venture to say that the world tries to control everything without surrendering it to the Lord, and we find ourselves being the same way that they are. All right, that was a sermonette before the sermon. So today what I want to do, and that was a, there was a reason I spoke on those things, because we all have control issues, and we're going to look at some characters in the Bible that had the same thing. But today what I want to do is take a look, once again, at the last couple of weeks that led up to Jesus' arrest and his crucifixion. We're going to look at three characters over the course of the next three weeks and once again preach a sermon entitled The Road to the Cross and we're going to see how their lives paralleled with his life and how their lives intersected with his life. And, and we will see in this series that every single one of them, just like you and I, had their very own agenda. We will see in their stories over the next three weeks how they all resisted God and how futile it was to fight against their heavenly father. Now watch this. They, believe it or not, were a lot like us. You can say amen if you want to. They wanted it their way, not God's way. And the scary part is, watch this, there is a little bit of them in every bit or in every one of us. And if we stop to think about it, our stories are really no different than theirs. We, like them, fight against God when God calls us and convicts us to do something, and then we ignore it and resist it because for some reason we think that we're a better boss than God is. We think that we can do it our way instead of his way, and our way will end up the right way. But can I give you some divine revelation today? God always knows better than we do. Amen? Once again, it makes no sense for you and I to resist the very God that we say that we respect, that we love, and that we trust. Can I give you some revelation today? Your and my self-control is... Nothing more than a destructive behavior. So let's unpack this sermon today. Can we do that? Let's unpack the sermon today and look at the first character in our series entitled The Road to the Cross. The first character's name is Joseph Caiaphas. I mean, if you've heard the name Caiaphas before in the Bible. 
And, and this morning, by, by comparing Caiaphas and Jesus, there could not be two more polarizing figures of, of, of Joseph Caiaphas and Jesus Christ. And, and what I'd like to do is, is share some things with you. And, and first of all, let's compare the two together today. One is a picture of an earthly high priest. The other is a picture of the eternal high priest. One made a, a, um, a sacrifice for our sins. The other became the ultimate sacrifice for our sins. One is a picture of religion. The other is a picture of a relationship. One is a picture of control. And the other is a picture of surrender. Now let me, let me give you some information on this man, Caiaphas, according to commentaries. Caiaphas was a high priest during Jesus' day. He ruled and reigned from 18 A.D. to 36 A.D. At this time in particular, he was the most powerful person in ancient Israel. Now I want you to understand that Israel was actually under Roman rule, and, and he was known as the bridge, if you will, that connected the, the, uh, the Roman Empire to the nation of Israel. And more importantly, he was part of a family of high priests that controlled the temple. This man controlled its power, its politics, and its religion. His family had a dynasty. Watch this. Starting with his father-in-law, Annas, a high priest, or former high priest, rather. Some people say he was actually the power behind the position that Caiaphas operated in. Annas was a former high priest, not to mention Caiaphas had five brothers-in-law who were also high priests at one time as well. And once again, commentaries tell us that since they were in control of the temple, that meant they were super wealthy. Jewish people from all over the ancient world would actually journey back to Jerusalem. And they would bring with them a, 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 an offering, if you will, called the temple tax which was equivalent to two days worth of wages. This tax was literally bringing in millions and millions of dollars every single year, watch this, into a 32 piece, or 32 acre rather, piece of prime property located in Jerusalem called the temple. I want you to understand this morning, there was so much money being poured into this place that it caught the attention of the Roman Empire. And all the Roman provinces. As a matter of fact, they actually tried to have laws passed that would not allow money out of their territory and, and pumped into the, to the temple. They wanted to keep some of that money for themselves and keep the money in their own countries. Because literally they were losing millions of dollars every single year. Caiaphas, our character today, had control over the crowds. Caiaphas was known as a man of power. He had position. He had prestige because he controlled the temple and all of his treasures. I believe it's safe to say that Caiaphas was the man. Can I get a witness, somebody? He was the man, the top dog, if you will. He was, he was the undefeated champion, unrivaled and unchallenged until all of a sudden, out of nowhere, a Jewish carpenter turned teacher stepped out of the background into the forefront. As many of you can guess, this man's name was Jesus. And Caiaphas is immediately intimidated by Jesus. I love the fact that Jesus was not your typical teacher. Come on, he didn't bore you to death and put you to sleep. Come on, somebody. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that Jesus spoke with power and with authority. And every time Jesus opened his mouth, everybody was amazed at the anointed words that proceeded from the Messiah's mouth. Can you say amen? And since Jesus spoke with power and he spoke with authority, watch this, that put him in a position to draw some huge crowds. And what made matters worse for Caiaphas is that the people who hated Jesus the most were actually eyewitnesses of seeing Jesus divinely de deliver people from demonic bondage. They saw the blind receive their sight. Come on, somebody. They saw the deaf hear. They saw the lame walk. They saw the mute talk. And they were actually, once again, an eyewitness to Jesus feeding thousands of people with a couple of sardines and a couple of saltines. And then all of a sudden, 
they took up basketfuls of remains, Jesus proved to them that you cannot outgive God. Can I get a witness, somebody? Now watch this. With every sign, with every wonder, with every miracle, Caiaphas began to lose his grip, and he was steadily losing his control, and he hated every single minute of it. Everywhere that Jesus went, he drew massive amounts of men and women. Huge crowds would follow Jesus everywhere he went from the time that he cast the demon out of the man in the synagogue and then walked down to the seashore where he stood on dry or the water like dry ground and, and then everybody followed him to Simon Peter's house where he healed the sick. And the Bible says demons were cast out. They followed Jesus everywhere that he went. These crowds followed Jesus. And watch as they were threat to Caiaphas. These crowds were threat to Rome itself. The reason being is because they thought that the crowds meant rebellion. Watch this. And rebellion would mean resistance. And resistance meant revolt. And revolt would ultimately lead to war. But Caiaphas did not want any of these things during his reign. And the reason that Caiaphas was so upset is because Rome could step in at any time. Remember, Israel was under Roman rule. And Caiaphas knew that at any given moment that Rome could step in and literally take away his position. And when they took away his position, Caiaphas knew that without his position, he wouldn't have his power. Without his power, he would not have his prestige. And without his prestige, he would not have his palace. He was desperately trying to keep it all together and keep it under control. Watch this. The religious leaders knew that whoever controlled the crowds controlled the people. Whoever controlled the people controlled the power. Another reason that they did not care for Jesus was because he did not mince his words. <laughs> I love it. Jesus told it like it was. Come on, he never sugarcoated anything, and he never, ever watered anything down. You never had to wonder what Jesus was thinking because he always told you what he thought. Come on, somebody. Let's look at Matthew 23 and verse 33. I love what happened. Here's how Jesus spoke to the religious leaders. He said, you snakes. Come on, that got their attention. Can you see, amen? He said, you brood of vipers. How will you escape being condemned to hell? Come on, you got to love his honesty. Jesus didn't say, you saints. He said, you snakes. He didn't say, my brothers, come on, somebody. He said, you brood of vipers. Keep in mind, the people he was speaking to were the religious leaders of the day. He told them, you might be clean on the outside, but man, you're super dirty on the inside. What you've got is religion, and you have no relationship, and the religion will only get you so far, but without a right relationship with God, Jesus said, you're going to bust hell wide open. Come on, somebody. See, Caiaphas had a major problem with Jesus. Watch this. Not because of the crowds, not because the crowds he drew, nor how he called them on the carpet. That wasn't his issue. It was not the conversation that Jesus had, nor the confrontation that he had with the religious leaders. But watch this. The major problem they had was because of Jesus' compassion. See, it was his compassion that he had that led him to raise Lazarus from the dead. And after this mighty miracle, the religious leaders could no longer discredit him of his divinity. Come on, somebody. They could no longer say he was a fake, a phony, or a false prophet. They knew who Jesus was. And what made this miracle so powerful was that Lazarus not only had died, but the Bible said he was buried in a tomb. And watch this. Jesus purposely waited for four long days to come back to Bethany to resurrect him. And guys, let me, let me stop here and preach for just a second. Do you realize every other time in the Bible when Jesus would raise someone from the dead, they had died that day, and none of them were ever buried. Think about that. So Lazarus' miracle held a lot more weight. Can you say amen? 
And I love the fact that Jesus purposely waited four days. If you ever wondered why he waited for four days, well, you read some commentaries. A lot of ancient Jewish belief thought that when somebody died, their spirit, watch this, would hover around their body for three to four days before their spirit would actually leave their body and, and go to their appointed place. So what did Jesus do? He had to dispel the myth. Come on. He purposely waited for four days so nobody could think, well, Lazarus really wasn't all the way dead. Can you say amen? <laughs> and I love the fact that when, when Jesus resurrected Lazarus, the crowds begin to explode and, and grow even more. And Caiaphas knew that his plan of trying to discredit Jesus was not working because too many people were an eyewitness to Jesus personally raising Lazarus from the dead. Man, I love the story. You know the story in John chapter 11 that once again Jesus purposely waited four days. And once Jesus got there, Mary, Mary began to have a, a, a confrontation with Jesus. Lord, if you had only been here. Come on, she, she was saying Jesus was late. Come on, but what do we say here? He's never late, seldom early, but what? Always right on time. Make no mistake about it. Jesus showed up right in the perfect timing to perform a, pure, a, a perfect miracle from the throne of God. Listen, I love the fact when Jesus had this conversation, he said, Lord, if you had only been here. And I love what Jesus said. First of all, we, ha we know that he had compassion because the Bible says in John eleven thirty five, 35, the shortest verse in the Bible, by the way, Jesus wept. He loved Lazarus. Loved him so much he raised him from the dead. And I want you to know that Jesus looked at her and said, where is he? Remember, man, she was all about Jesus raising her brother from the dead. But when he called her on the carpet, she began to backpedal. Come on, how many of you know we do that all the time? God, if you just do this, then he begins to do it. Say, wait, wait. I don't know about all that, Lord. It's not the way I would do it. Come on, somebody. That's called control, and we're going to learn to get rid of it today. Amen? Amen. Jesus looks at her and said, where is he? She goes, Lord, he stinks. That's what the Bible says. you got to love the King James says he stinketh. Come on, somebody. She said, God, he, Lord, he's been dead for four days. Listen, do you realize they prepared his body for burial with spices and ointments, and then he wrapped him in grave clothes, and then they put him in the tomb for four days. But Jesus... Being the Lord over everything, including death, told her to roll the stone away. Then I love the fact that the Lord stepped into the entrance of the tomb. The Bible says he called him by name. Come on, and, and that's a powerful point. He had to call him by name. The Bible says he said, Lazarus, come forth. And the Bible says he who was dead got up. And begin to come up out of the grave. Can you see? Amen. But have you ever wondered why Jesus purposely called Lazarus by name? Because if he wouldn't have said, Lazarus, come forth. If he would have just spoke the, name, the words, come forth. Everybody that was buried inside the tomb would have got up. And they would have walked again. Can you say amen? amen? I love the fact that Jesus purposely called him by name. And, and, and here's the awesome thing. Do you realize that that? That Jesus purposely picked the, one of the most popular people in the entire city of Bethany to raise from the dead. Why? Because everybody knew him. Come on, listen. Everybody knew him. Listen, nothing God does is random. Everything God does is on purpose for a purpose. Can you see? Amen. Let's look at John 12, 17. The Bible says, now the crowd, come on, there's the word that Caiaphas hates. The crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to what? Spread the word. The crowds that Caiaphas hated was not only expanding, they were also energizing. And more importantly, they were evangelizing. Can you see? Amen. See, now Caiaphas was worried more than ever before. Because the crowds were now telling people that not only does Jesus heal the sick and, and deliver people from devils, but he also has resurrecting power and can raise the dead. That's the people that, that believed in him, and that's the people that begin to spread the word. Amen. John 12, 18 says, many people, because they had heard 
that he had performed, this sign went out to meet him. The crowds were killing Caiaphas. Jesus' followers were growing larger by the day. Let's look at verse 19. So the Pharisees said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Come on. Revelation, can you say amen? Look how the whole world has gone after him. Listen, the religious leaders were a bunch of control freaks. Come on, now's a good time to say amen. They were a bunch of control freaks. And watch this. What was freaking them out the most was the control that they thought they had was slipping right through their fingers. They were losing it a little more every day. Why? Because every day a new miracle. Every day a new sign. Every day a new wonder. And people were growing larger and larger. And the crowds were growing. And every day Caiaphas lost a little bit more of his control. Verse 47a, watch this. Then the chief priest and the Pharisees called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. Guys, let me, let, me, let me stop here. You have no idea the importance of this verse. The Sanhedrin and the Pharisees all met together. And what you might not understand, let me break it down to, the, to you today in, in 2021, all right? What this would be equivalent of is if all the Republicans... All the Democrats, all the independents, all the Senate and the House, all, e- e- all agreed on something, watch this, and unanimously voted to pass it through. How many know that would be a miracle? Can you say amen? amen. Right? And, and that's the same thing that was happening right here. Listen, these groups hated each other. They couldn't be in the same room. Sound familiar? Come on. That's politics today, amen. This group didn't like each other. They didn't want to be around each other. They hated each other. And they could never, ever agree on anything at all except this one thing. Let's look at the next verse. One of them said, what are we accomplishing? Here is this man performing many signs. If we let him go like this, everyone will believe in him. Come on, they knew something was up. Can you see amen? (laughs) See, they knew within the heart of hearts that this radical rabbi, if you will, the one who worked miracles, the one who worked signs and wonders and and healed the sick and raised the dead, they knew in their heart of hearts that they, they needed to embrace him. But watch this. In order to embrace him, it meant that they needed to let go of what they were embracing. But what was it? What were they holding on to? Listen, it was their power, their position, their prestige. They were holding on to something they needed to let go of. They knew what to do, but listen, they were not willing to pay the price. They just could not let go and let God have his way. Sound familiar? Come on, we do that every day of our life. God, I know what I need to do, but I just don't want to let go. I love the analogy that Michael said you can never receive with a closed fist. Come on, listen to what I'm saying today. Because what are we trying to We're trying to hold on to what we need to let go of and let God have his will in his way. Amen. Verse 48 and verse uh, or, or B, look at this. And then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. That, that was their issue. They were scared once again that Rome would swoop in and take their power away from them and give it to somebody else. See, their issue was this. They were worried about the wrong things. They were worried about what was earthly and not what was eternal. Amen. How many of you know that when we decide to to follow Jesus, it's going to cost us something? Let me say that again. How many of you know that when we decide to follow Jesus, it's going to cost us something? And they were not willing to let go of their position or their possessions. Wow. Following Jesus is a lifelong investment, but make no mistake about it. It brings eternal dividends. Can you say amen? Amen. And I'm here today to tell you when you follow Jesus, it's going to cost you your control. It's going to cost you your comfort. Following Christ is never convenient. Can you say amen? Amen. Let me give you an example, and and some of you ain't going to like this, but I'm going to say it anyway. I got the mic today. (laughs) We work all week, some of us five days, some of us six days, and then all of a sudden when the weekend comes, we think, well, Lord, that's my time. It's time of rest, recuperation. Come on. 
It's time so that we can regenerate and relax. And, and, and so therefore, when it's time to come to church, the last thing we want to do is get involved in serving. The last thing we want to do is get involved in a small group because it takes too much of our time and apparently your time and my time is too valuable for the Lord. You're awful quiet today. John eleven forty nine 49 and 50 says, Then one of them named Caiaphas, who was a high priest that year, spoke up. Listen, he said, You know nothing at all. You don't realize that it is better for you than one man die for the people than the whole nation per- perish. You know, the crazy thing is Caiaphas actually sounded like he cared, like he was concerned for the people, but in reality, he was only concerned for his very own benefit. Let's go further. He was concerned about losing his power, his prestige, his position. He was concerned about losing the little bit of control that he still held on to. Remember, this crook named Caiaphas was in this prestigious position, if you will, for 18 long years. And the last thing that he wanted to do was give up, once again, the little bit of control that he was still clinging to. If he did lose control, it meant that he would not only lose his position, but watch this, he would ultimately lose his paycheck. Losing his paycheck meant that he would also lose his palace. And that's the last thing that Caiaphas wanted to give up. Can you see amen? But let's be honest today. Speaking of control, we all have a little bit of control freak Caiaphas deep down inside of us. Come on, shake your head this way. Let me know you're still with me. See, we say we want Jesus, but it must be on our terms, not his terms. We say we want Jesus, but only when it's convenient for us. We say we want Jesus, but only if you and I can control the outcome. Once again, like Caiaphas, we are more concerned with our comfort than we are our character. But Jesus is the exact opposite. He is more concerned with our character than he is our comfort. Can you say amen? Since you're awful quiet, let's move on. Let's look at the next verse. Then one of them named Caiaphas, once again, who was high priest, spoke up and said, you know nothing at all. Let's look at this one more time. Let me explain this. As high priest, Caiaphas had a job. That job was to once a year go into the Holy of Holies and perform a sacrifice for the sins of the people. See, Caiaphas was called to hear from God, and yet he could not recognize God's only son right in front of him. That's what happens when you have religion. You know about him. But relationship means you recognize him. See, you can have head knowledge and heart knowledge, and you can be 18 inches away from heaven or hell. Can you say amen? Amen. Listen closely. He went on to say this. You don't realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than the whole nation perish. Little did he know that he was being used by God. Watch this. How many know God works in mysterious ways? I've always said if God could use a donkey to speak, come on somebody. If God can use crazy characters in the Bible, even a backslid high priest, come on somebody. Then God can surely use you and I. Can you say amen? Caiaphas was being used by God. Little did he know to declare a divine truth. Watch this. As high priest. The Bible tells us he actually prophesied about the death of Jesus and his plan to save the entire mankind. But not only that, watch this, unbeknownst to him, he wasn't only prophesying about the Jewish nation coming to receive Christ. He was also prophesying about the Gentile nation coming into the fold. And also anybody and everybody that called on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Here's what the Bible says, John 11 51 and 52. He did not say this on his own. But as high priest, watch this, that year he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. Let's go on. And not only for that nation, but also for what? The scattered children of God, the Gentiles. That's you and I. Come on, somebody. To bring them together and make them one. Hebrews 5, 8 and 9 says this. Jesus was God's son. From the things he suffered, God qualified him as the perfect high priest. And it became the source of eternal salvation to all those who obey him. All means all. Can you see? Amen. Amen. Ephesians 4.4 says, there is one body and one spirit. There is one hope 
in which you were called. Listen closely. Because of his control issues, Caiaphas lost his way. He was all out to kill Jesus so he could preserve his power, his prestige, his paycheck, his palace, and even his position. But let's get one thing straight. God's plans will never be thwarted by man's agenda. Come on, now's a good time to say amen. I need a better one, somebody. In fact, man just thinks that we're in control. When all the time, I venture to say that God is using man to serve his purpose and allow his will to come to pass. Let's look at these verses that back up what I'm saying today. John eleven fifty three 53 says this. So from that day on, they plotted to take his life. Plotted. And watch this. To what? Take his life. But Jesus let them know, you can't take it. John 10, 18 says, no one takes it from me. But I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and also authority to take it up again. In other words, I might be down, but good God Almighty, I'm not out. Come on, somebody. Listen, when the Jewish leaders came to arrest Jesus, after having the Passover meal with his disciples, he was in the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. And when they came to arrest him, listen, here's what they needed. They needed to question him. And they needed someone to rule on his fate if he was guilty or innocent. So the Bible says he was brought before the Sanhedrin. Remember the group that can't get along? He was brought before them. And he had several false witnesses lined up to speak lies about him. And here's the crazy part. They brought him to Caiaphas. In other words, he was at Caiaphas' house. And this crazy control freak thought everything was playing out into his own hands. But despite all the false witnesses... All the lies and, and, and everything that begin to speak about Jesus, no one could find any reason to sentence Jesus to death. So Caiaphas, once again, needing the ultimate control, stood up and asked him directly. Here's what he said. I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. And I love what Jesus said. He didn't stutter. He said, you have said so. After hearing these words, the Bible says Caiaphas tore his robe and cried blasphemy. Watch this. The result of this rigged trial was that Jesus was pronounced worthy of death, and he was beaten, and he was mocked. See, Rome had taken away the power to, uh, for Israel to execute anybody. So what he had to do, they had to take Jesus and send him from, from, uh, from under Jewish rule to the governor of Rome named Pontius Pilate. He was tried through the night, which, by the way, was illegal according to Jewish customs. And the Bible says in the end, Jesus was sentenced to die. He was bruised, beaten, battered. Then they led him outside of the city to be crucified on the cross of Calvary. But watch this. Let me slow down for just a second. This high priest of God named Caiaphas was called by God, used by God, but somewhere along the way, it was no longer for God's glory. See, that's what control does. It takes the glory away from God, and we try to keep the glory for ourselves. Remember what I said last week in Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 8? God said, I will not share my glory with anyone. Amen. And God said it then, and he still believes it today. Amen. And, and watch this. Perhaps at one point, Caiaphas actually thought he was doing God's will. Come on, that's what we always think until we start slipping off in the wrong direction. But clearly, watch this, he had not stopped in a long while to examine his own heart. See, his ministry in his life became his own agenda for his own glory, not God's glory any longer. This high priest, watch this, was full of religion, but he was empty of God's spirit that would lead him into all truth, proving that you can have religion and still not have spiritual enlightenment. You can have religion and still not have discernment. You can have religion but still not have a right relationship with your heavenly father. In fact, think about this. He had Jesus, the word that became flesh, truth incarnate, standing right in front of him. He had Jesus in his very home. But he failed to recognize that Jesus was the way, the truth, and the life. Finally, let's recognize one major thing about Caiaphas, in just one famous sentence, Caiaphas literally uncovered the heart of the gospel. 
Next verse, look at this. He said, it is better for you that one man die for the people than the whole nation perish. Guys, let me read something to you. I'm going to read this in closing. This is entitled the gospel, and this is so rich. One man dies for all. The innocent dies for the guilty. The just dies for the unjust. The Son of God took the place of sinners. He took the punishment. He suffered for our sins. He paid the price. Caiaphas spoke truth. He stared truth in the face. He brought truth into his home, but he never let the truth into his heart. And he never let it rule over his life. Guys, I don't know where you're at today. And it's really not important that I do. Because God knows all things. But let me challenge you today. If you're wrestling with some issues that you're desperately trying to control, stop fighting. Stop resisting. No matter how much you want to hang on to something, you've got to learn to let go. You'll never receive with a closed fist. Come on. You'll never let God be in control if you're in control. We need to surrender to our Savior and live a life of peace. We can't hold on to things that we're never meant to hold on to. Here's the key. Let him have control of everything that you're fighting with. Everything that you're wrestling with. Let God have control because you were never meant to have it. Can you see amen? amen. Guys, can we close our eyes and bow our heads this morning?